Okay, we're recording. Hello, everyone. It is Thursday, June 15th. This is a regular scheduled TSO meeting. Thank you for joining us. This meeting is being recorded. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So I am going to call on everyone just to double check that we can be heard and hear each other. Uh, so in our present, Andy. Yes, I'm here. Anna. Present. Athena. I'm here. <laughs> Kelly. Here. And Gilford. Where'd you go, Guilford? Paul, we see you, Paul. Hi, Paul. And Guilford, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Mandy is in the uh, attendee group. Okay. So um, if you, when you get to there, we need to bring her in. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so. With that, so we're going to go right into public comment. If we have any members, we have three attendees, Darcy Dumont, Mandy Joe, and Tracy Zafran. If would anyone like to make a public comment? If so, please raise your hand now. Okay, I see Tracy. Welcome, Tracy. And uh Tracy, the floor is yours for up okay. to three minutes. Okay. Thank I you will. for joining. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, I will try to be brief. So I'm here um, um, just to speak about the proposed streetlights policy. I wasn't able to attend the last meeting, but I did see the recording and heard that I was mentioned a number of times, and I can stay later in the meeting if that would be helpful. Um, so I think I just, I mean, I did send comments on um, the latest version of the policy that I had seen to the council sponsors. Um, I didn't send them to the full committee, but I'm happy to share them now. Um, so, so one of the things is, I mean, this proposed policy initially came before the council and then to the TSO last summer. And since it did, I mean, my focus on it and my areas of concern and the things that I've commented on have always been about the transportation safety, um, which seemed a little bit minimized in the original policy approach. Um, and also just minimizing the risk and cutting potential yet unintended risks um, and for road users, especially those who are the most vulnerable. And I've also had a focus on the perceptions of safety, um, just because those perceptions of safety, transportation safety will impact people's choices about, you know, if they leave their homes at night, um, if they feel comfortable walking or biking after dark and so on. Um, and so one of the things I mentioned to the council sponsors is that TAC met last week and um, we talked a little bit about our recommendation that we made initially about having streetlights at bus stops and crosswalks. Um, and we walked it back a little bit um, because thinking about it, we do think that for bus stops and for crosswalks that are used at night, um, that it is important to have some lighting, but that lighting does not necessarily have to be street lighting. Uh, so, um, and in fact, it seemed that the proposal to encourage to have street lighting at all PVT bus stops throughout town might be overkill because not all of those bus stops are served at night. Um, I mean, or have routes at night, and then all of them have many people. And I think many of them don't have lighting now, like don't have street lighting now, but they could have some illumination that would help um, both with customer um, transit riders using the buses and also just with safety. And so most of my comments are related to just the dimming of lights. Um, and so one of the things is, 
and I know that you know there's been some back and forth about it. Um, one of the things is with the idea with the village center. So I do support dimming of lights. I mean, I'm not a fan of light pollution either. Um, I'm not a fan of, you know, campuses around me that stay lit all night long. I'm not a fan of Eversource light poles that put the lights up, you know, way beyond the roadway and where they don't actually do much good for anybody and they just spread the light more. And so, um, but I think it's just really important to be intentional when we make decisions about the lighting and making sure that we don't have any unintended consequences. Um, so one thing with the dimming, um, so one of the things I heard last time is that I had mentioned, I think Shalini brought forth the idea of keeping the street light lighting up in the village centers until at least midnight because the policy as written says 11 or within one hour after the end of closing time of the last bar live music menu. Um, and that the, one of the comments, some of the comments that were made during the last TSO meeting will said, said that, you know, that um, that the TSO members had looked and the sponsors had looked at the the bus schedules and so on. And so actually the lights were probably not going to be dimmed until 2 or 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, at certain, uh, for certain days. So the thing is that it's not, if somebody just reads I'm, I'm the policy. Sorry, excuse me, Tracy. Yes. Just for a moment. Um, just would you mind, because we do have a okay. packed agenda. How about this? We're going to go into um, the waste hauler, but that's going to come yes. first. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. And then as we get back to um, the street lights, we can, you know, uh, welcome you for an additional uh, three minute comment. Does that okay. work? All right. Uh, that Thank would be fine. So Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Okay. So we are going to move on to our proposed amendments to general bylaw. Our refuse collection. Um, uh, lead sponsor Shalini will not be here with us this evening. So I'm going to refer to Paul if you have um, you know any anything else you know to add or or um, lead us through the latest. I think Guilford actually is and Guilford, sorry. Yeah. Update us on where we are with the RFI. If you're still here, Guilford. There you go. All right, Guilford, the floor is yours. Oh, sorry. Oops. Thank you. I was supposed to be done with the update of my draft this week. Uh, we had a couple issues at the wastewater plant, which kind of took a lot of my time. So I am halfway through that um, RFI. I should be done probably by Monday or Tuesday next week. Um, so that's where I am, and I will have that available for you guys to review. There are... Um, um, that's basically the update. Uh, there's lots of conflicting comments being said around here, and I'm really just writing this to gather information to put together how we would do a well, one to put together a cost estimate based on the information we get back. So you can see a rough preliminary cost of what this may cost us, and then to decide if we want to move forward with an RFP. So that's how I'm approaching this, um, just so you know. Um, and that's, if you have any questions, you can ask. Okay, were there any, any members with questions right now? Andy, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Guilford. And I'm sorry that you had such a difficult day. Paul kept us informed about it. And I thought about you today and Amy and realizing how tough it was on you guys. Um, the, uh, Questions on the RFI. <clears throat> um, I assume that um, it will give us some indication of what kinds of questions that we would be asking in the RFI. And we, was it the intent that the committee is going to be able to look at the uh, look at them and see if they coincide with the goals that we have and explore those those options um how i guess how is there do you have any more specificity about um how the committee 
might be engaging and the sponsors might be engaging in the RFI. And the questions do revolve around many of the things you've talked about, um, pay as you throw, how you, how how would a vendor set up pay as you throw if they're vendors who actually do pay as you throw, and then kind of asking general questions about where they do it and how much they're charging in those areas, or just even if they don't tell us how much they're charging is where they're doing it more and where they've done it recently. Um, the other big question, is composting, everyone has been asking about how to curbside composting. There will be some requests for information on whether the vendors that are in the area are doing curbside composting, whether they could expand to curbside composting. Um, and then there's a lot of questions about if we did this, I don't see the town, the town wanting to require this rule immediately for the entire town. Um, I'm kind of have broken the town up in the four different categories. There's the university, there's businesses, there's large apartment complexes and condominium associations, and then there's small um, duplexes and single family residences, which actually makes up about 4,500 units in town. There's almost a total of, um, there's about 80 8,000, 9,000 parcels in town, which actually includes undeveloped land too. So the goal is to concentrate on that large group of about 4,500 people and how we would serve them first. And that's kind of how I'm also directing the RFI. It's not that we're going to take over. We're not going to implement this to me for the whole town. We're going to implement stages and how a vendor would think that would work or if they truly would say you should just bite the whole apple and do everything at once. So that's kind of another, those are the three areas are the main questions about the RFI. Um, there's a couple other areas I've asked about too, but <clears throat> pay as you throw, how would you, how do you implement pay as you throw? Do you do pay as you throw? Curbside composting, how do you do it? How do you implement it? And then how would phase in a, some type of service like this to the whole town? And then there's a couple of smaller questions, which are just, um, incidentals, I guess that's what I would call them. Yeah, um, I guess the one thought that I have and the reason I was asking about this is that I'm always a little bit nervous about using the term pay as you throw because it can be taken to imply a method of doing something as opposed to a goal of doing something because the goal is to uh, encourage people to reduce the amount of trash that's being picked up that is going to go to a regular landfill or whatever disposal method is being used. And uh, that we want to um, encourage decrease in that by making it economically, uh, giving an economic reward to people with lower bills if they have less, but it's not, you know, pays you throws is out of that term that comes out of um, bags. Um, and uh, the days when you used to toss bags, well, it's not necessarily uh, what we're talking about because it's really pay, is, pay for the amount you throw uh, is maybe a more, or pay for the amount you dispose of, I think is the more accurate description of the goal and it gives a little bit more breadth to what different vendors may say is how they would achieve that goal. So that's one theme that um, I'm looking at very closely. Um, and, uh, you know, I think composting has been and continues to be of strong interest because it is another way of reducing trash and reducing trash that um, causes uh, methane leakage from landfills. So those are the things we we're thinking about. The other, the last thing that I was uh, just wanted to mention in this uh, litany is that uh, the uh, question had arisen when, uh, We've talked about this more recently about whether there are advantages to um, allowing um, 
or in seeing if there's interest from the vendors in every other week trash pickup. Because if we are going to reduce um, the amount that people put in and uh, if, if we're going to also try and reduce, uh, control the cost that we're charging to uh, people who are subscribing to the service, it's possible to do uh, the, the South Hadley's approach of every other week is the correct approach. Um, and uh, so we don't know how that fits into the RFI process. So those were the thoughts that I had had about it. Um, then I have one other topic I want to talk to later, but it's not necessarily an RFI process. Okay. Did you want to? Yeah, one of the, I do talk. I think you're frozen, Gilbert. Oh, no, I just stopped. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you started talking and I stopped. Um, I, I do talk a little bit about the, 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 the cycle of pickup, the frequency of pickup in the RFI as well. Um, I'm not really sure we're going to see. I'm not really sure biweekly can work for us, especially during um, school year. It might be something that could be done in the summer, but then again, vendors may not want to do it that way either. So I also have a section that talks about what we affectionately call bailout, which is um, when the college students leave twice a year and we have a lot of trash. Um, that's in the RFI as well. I had a question. Um, Gilford, you mentioned that there was a lot of conflicting information. Um, didn't know if you wanted to elaborate on that and or is there anything that the you know sponsors or us as a committee uh, could do to help clarify? Um, not, not at this moment. I mean, we've decided to do the RFI. I think I'm just putting together as much many questions as I can to ask, and then we can sit down and discuss. I mean, the, the bigger question, biggest question is, is what do we think the final number is going to be to actually provide this service? Um, because that has to be what's approved is that we approve that as a budget, as a budget number somewhere in the process. Thank you. Andy, did you you mentioned you had something else too? Yeah, the other thing that I was just going to mention, Gilford, is that um, when you were um, at the finance committee meeting in the middle of May, presenting it was mostly about the uh, obviously the, the budgets for your department and for the enterprise funds, and uh, that's what we were really focusing on. Plus, the capital for your department came up in discussion, but. One thing that you had mentioned briefly, and uh, I responded to the real quick response, but then dropped it because it was irrelevant to the purpose of the meeting, which was uh, whether the current recycle center um, at the old uh, at the old landfill, but not the old old landfill, um, whether that's going to continue in operation for an alternative for people who don't want to pay a higher price to have home pickup. And you had indicated that you had been not assuming that. And uh, I don't know that it's a conversation we need to have today, but I think the committee ought to be talking about that because I think that we have uh, to t um, at least observed that there's a large public interest uh, from current users of um, maintaining that option, and I don't know what your why, um, what your thinking was about why it was not advisable to continue to offer that alternative. Well, originally we thought that if you're going to have curbside, if you're going to have a company that's doing curbside throughout the town, why would anybody want to? 
take a Saturday to bring their trash to the transfer station. And we were thinking that that transfer station would change in how it operates. Um, but then again, we started looking at what we actually take at the transfer station. And to tell the truth, even if a third of the customers want to bring their waste to the transfer station and charge a lesser rate, um, we, that's the biggest commodity we take at the transfer station. So we originally thought we might have to be changed, but it's going to have to stay open. Uh, it's going to have to stay open for other customers that we have who would not be utilizing the curbside pickup if we go if, if we don't do it town wide immediately. Um, a lot of the rental properties use the transfer station for the affectionately known bailout period where they bring a lot of trash that's left and that their haulers can't take. We get a lot of mattresses, we get a lot of air conditioners, we get a lot of appliances um, at the end of the school years when people are moving out, things are being changed or upgraded. So the transfer station is going to have to stay open. Um, and even, even then, um, but we don't we don't see why there would be such a, we don't see why there would be that many residents actually using it except for people who have these special special needs but all the services would have to stay open just for that group that have special needs so it would stay open and that, that was something we thought currently before and that's kind of what I was trying to explain during the finance committee and if I said it differently then I apologize no, I don't, it was a question of it was that it wasn't the purpose of our of that meeting. So, um, the, you know, your comment was very brief, and I thought a longer response. Uh, I would be I was certainly interested in, which is why I asked. Uh, because those are the issues, mm -hmm. the things that I had, and I guess that I hope that we get a chance to. Uh, um uh, have the committee and possibly the uh counselor sponsors at least looking at the uh rfi uh it, it so that we can see that the questions being asked are the questions that um uh, we agree are are missing some questions that we'd like to that, that we might be interested in Anna, did you have a question or anything you would like to add? No, it wasn't. I didn't have a question. I um, I had a similar comment to what Andy was saying, which is I'd really love to be able to look at the RFI. Um, I know that you took our input into account, I think, um, and I appreciate that. And um, it would it would be great if the, the committee and, and the sponsors could see it um, at some point before before it goes out, if that's if that's acceptable. Um, but no, Andy, Andy covered it. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Guilford. Was there anything else to add or, or Paul? Did you have anything to add? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. <clears throat> I'll, I'll hang around for the street lights if you have questions about them too. Yes, please. Yes, please. That would be helpful. Uh, so in the interim, we are moving on to the approval of minutes. Did everyone have a chance to take a look? Okay. All right. Uh, I move. Oh, sorry. I was going to try okay. to. Right ahead. Right ahead. Uh, I move we approve the minutes of 524 and 61 of TSO. Okay. I'll second. And uh, we'll go roll call. Andy. Yes. Anna. Aye. And I am an I. So that's. Uh, I guess we'll be unanimous with two absent. Okay, so that's done. And we're moving right on to uh, town manager appointments. Paul, you're absolutely on a roll. Would you like to walk us through the Conservation Commission appointments? Sure. I just have one set of appointments, and this is for the Conservation Commission. We have a lot more coming your way uh, for next time. So these two appointments are for uh, three-year terms 
for, uh, and we're losing two very strong members of the Conservation Commission, but I'm very pleased to report that we have very two strong members ready to join. So Jason Dorney is a project manager in a stormwater um, company that's actually based in California, but he works uh, remotely from Amherst. Uh, he's involved in his neighborhood association. He's been involved in uh, stormwater management uh, professional associations. Um, really uh, a terrific person who will be a, a strong addition to the Conservation Commission. Uh, and the other is Bruce Stedman, who many people may know is the former director of, or maybe currently still of, of the Conway School of Landscape Architecture. And he's pretty much done everything. He's got lots of different degrees um, and um, has done a million things in his, in his career. Um, now sort of winding down his professional life, but looking to stay involved in the community, which we're really pleased by. So two very strong additions to the Conservation Commission. Great. I wanna make sure there aren't any questions before I jump in with my mm -hmm. motion. Andy, do you have a question or a comment about the appointments? No, I do not. I think that uh, they're good well explained choices yeah i'm excited about this the obviously the conservation commission is near and dear to my heart and you these are great folks and i know that we've got we've had some really incredible folks on the concom that are cycling off and so i'm i was eagerly awaiting who was mm -hmm. going to go on because it's a really so we, body. yeah we were nervous because of the people cycling off are very very strong so good so good yeah. And so yeah you got you got two good replacements so we were lucked out yeah yeah <laughs> Um, Paul, I have a really important question. Did you get a haircut? I got them all cut. Yes, I did. Oh, uh, dad joke. Summer okay, um, it, it looks great. And now I'm ready I to- said I, it's, a, it's Father's Day, so she said I got them all cut. <laughs> I appreciate that. Good dad right. joke. <laughs> uh, I move for the Town Services and Outreach Committee to recommend to the Town Council the Town Manager appointments of Jason Dorney and Bruce Stedman to the Conservation Commission for terms to expire June 30th, 2026. Second. Thank you. Would you mind repeating that just one more time Absolutely. for the sake of the minutes? Thank you. Sure thing. Uh, I move for the town services and outreach committee to recommend to the town council, the town manager appointments of Jason Dorney and Bruce Stedman to the conservation commission for terms to expire June 30th, 2026. Second. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you, Andy. And Anna. Okay, so I call it Anna. Aye. Andy. Aye. And I'm an aye. So that's unanimous with two absent. All right. So if we would please invite Mandy, bring Mandy into the room so we can move on to the review and discussion about the proposed streetlights policy. Hi, Mandy. Hello. Here's, all right, there you are, wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to again hand the floor over to Mandy and Anna. Thank you for all your work with us in advance. The floor is yours. Thank you. So Mandy and I have made some updates to the policy based on the feedback that we um, have been receiving. Um, and that updated version is in your packet for today. I also did want to follow up on one question. I know Shalini had asked it and it's, and she's not here, but I'll say it for the record. Um, I also spoke with the uh, folks at the bid and the chamber regarding the streetlights proposal. They did not have concerns about the streetlights proposal. Their concerns actually really uh, uh, were about lighting in parking lots specifically. And so that was something that I'm going to pass along to Paul. Um, they were not concerned about the, the levels in the policy as defined. They just wanted to ensure that parking lots were um, sufficiently lit in the evenings. Um, so I'm just sharing that that was the feedback I received from them. Um, and Mandy, do you want to? I'm Thank sorry, you. Anna, Mike, I just had an, an issue where you just muted. Could you just repeat that last part that you oh. said? 
just yeah, so sorry. of course, of course. So mm -hmm. basically the takeaway, just, uh, I wanted to confirm that I did speak to the bid and the chamber um, regarding businesses and that they were not concerned with anything in the policy. Their main concerns regarding lighting generally applied to um, the parking lots on Prey Street and other downtown areas. Uh, and they they kind of had a separate concern of ensuring that those were were lit, but they didn't feel that this policy prevented that. They just don't feel that they necessarily currently are. Thank you. So Paul, that, that's passing that to you um, <laughs> as an FYI right now. I, I have done my my duty on that. Um, Mandy, do you wanna do you want me to try to jump in or do you want it doesn't matter to me. I can go over the changes and then the one I think that we would at least recommend based on Tracy's comments um, that we received um, that's not in here or is in here that we'd remove. So um, we tried to, given that there's so much red in here because of how you do changes to documents, um, I highlighted in yellow where the changes between the last version you saw and this version are. Um, and so this was done before we received Tracy's um, comments. So we'll come back to the regional bus stops after <laughs> we go through what we did change. Um, right there's the first one, um, which was there was discussion last time about um, the lighting could be requested virtually everywhere in town. And so there was a request to delete that both from TAC and from a couple of TSO members, I believe. Um, and so we came up with new language that we're we think um, works for deleting the phrase, but um, gets across what some of our concerns were in just flat out deleting the phrase. So um, we've provided a potential change there um, in terms of what that might look like um, instead of the phrase, because such lighting could be requested virtually everywhere in town. Um, we have added, or proposed the addition of in order to maintain equity of determinations for all residents. Um, so um, we've done that. And then the other change is uh, the couple pages down, I believe, um, page uh, five. Yeah. And this one was about dimming. There's a lot of questions about dimming right there. And so instead of changing the language itself, um, while we recognize when the relamping occurs, if this policy is passed, there may need to be more conversations around dimming. We would really like to keep this language in, um, but given all of the concerns about, well, what are the right streets? Should all streets be dimmed? What about the timing, all of that? Uh, we thought it best to just, instead of trying to change the language we've proposed, add a phrase, add the sort of comment um, and allowance for the uh, superintendent of public works to, uh, the council to waive the dimming. Um, and we put for moderate or heavy pedestrian traffic. We could talk about that language um, in other areas. Uh, to respond to some of uh, Tracy and tax comments about dimming on um, concerns about pedestrian heavy or moderate pedestrian traffic she's she's talked about I think um, not having dimming at all on sort of major arterial or collector roads um, the main roads in town um, or those that have a lot of pedestrians um, we were couldn't we couldn't come up with a way to define that easily. Um, because thinking about roadways in town, there are some major roadways in town where we probably don't either want or need a lot of lighting at night. And so dimming is absolutely acceptable. Um, and many people probably would say it's okay. And uh, Anna likes to reference Bay Road. Um, I live there. <laughs> uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's one of our arterial east west roads. Um, but it does not have a lot of pedestrian traffic late at night. And so it probably could use, and it has a lot of conservation and forest land and all sorts of things like that late at night. Uh, well, it had the land's there all the time, but, um, and so dimming there is probably appropriate. So taking it, we, we, we thought about that blanket approach that we had originally proposed in terms of like just lighting areas and lighting zones um, is problematic for dimming too. 
Um, so that's why we proposed this language. And I also, yeah, I also want to, I want to jump in here. I think one of the, one of the concerns that, or one of the challenges that Mandy and I faced when we were thinking about dimming is that it's really hard to find uh, examples to demonstrate to people what dim lighting, dimmed lighting looks like. And so, you know, we can, we can point to different areas. So um, Cambridge is one, Pepperell is another. Um, and to, to give reference points for those two places, Pepperell, <laughs> Pepperell just never runs their lights above 30%. Their lights are always dimmed to 30. Um, and Cambridge dims down to 35%. So when we think about the dimming that we're proposing, which is 70, right? Um, I, I, it's, it's tough to do that comparison. And so having this in here also allows us to demonstrate and, and do those kind of not uh, test isn't the right words, but demonstrations, right, of what dimmed lights may look like. Um, and, and one of the things that was really interesting, and never mind, I'll pause there, but no, actually I'll mention it. So one of the things that we, we were referencing in this was the um, Federal Highway Administration design criteria for adaptive roadway lighting, um, where they found that the, the dimming of the lights was not the um, was not statistically significant in terms of the impact on, um, I, I don't wanna phrase it wrong, on accidents that happened on, on um, on injury, on injuries that happened. And so it was, there were really interesting guidelines from them in terms of recommending dimming versus what other other towns have done, which is turning off like every other street light, right? Um, so this is one of the ways that adaptive street lighting seems to be going, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll pause there. Um, and, and then I would just say, if we can go back up to page one, um, I haven't talked with Anna about this, but we had proposed based on tax recommendation, the addition of, in terms of placement, the regional transit stops. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like from the email we received and from Tracy's comment tonight, that TAC has um, sort of rethought that recommendation. And so I, I would certainly agree to removing that proposed addition so bringing it back to where our certain our current place standards are um Anna can speak to uh her thing too but we had put that in because of tax recommendation and if they are changing their recommendation based on conversations we've all had um I, I'm certainly willing to go back to the original language there and remove that bullet point I am as well I think that's all uh, we changed the, the last thing, Andy's concern about the implementation part. Um, that's yes. awesome. So yeah. thank you. So that's on page, I left the motion last, in, um, page yeah. six, I think, um, up above that, up, I think. Up. It's in the blue. It's in the blue, yeah. yeah. Um, a suggested language, obviously this is only suggested, the dates are suggested, um, you know, um, but the goal of this, you know, and then the motion that the council would be the council's keeper of the public way or whatever it would be. But um, the goal is to say, if this passes the council, the the lights that are installed after September 1, 2023 or fully replaced. Um, and so to, to give you an idea of what my thinking is in fully replaced and this language might need some help, but um, we had just recently talked about as keeper of the public way, the um, duct bank installation on College Street that in a couple years will allow for the removal of the light pole, the, the utility poles along College Street for a certain amount of length. Those utility poles have lights on them, I believe. And so when the poles go, there aren't, they aren't really quote new street lights. Um, well, you could maybe argue whether they're new or not, but we're probably going to want to put some lighting in, street lighting in, but there won't be poles to put them on. And so if those are considered, a, I, I would consider those replacement lights. You're buying entirely new fixtures, but there was a light there. So I didn't think it would necessarily fall under the new um, because the light's already been there. You're sort of replacing it, but that's my, my thinking of what replacement means. Um, so anything where you're like doing everything, um, or even if you're replacing the bulb, make sure it complies with this, but um, that would be September 1, 2023, anything installed after that is the proposal here. And then 10 years from that date is when all existing streetlights that existed before September 1 would have to come into compliance with the policy. I know it's a long time frame. Um, 
I don't, you know, that's, that's what we kind of came up with. Why we picked September 1 and not immediately. Uh, order, I, I thought about order windows. Uh, there might be projects that are, the lights are already ordered for. Um, and we don't want them to have to reorder a completely new set if they don't comply with this policy. Um, so there's sort of that window there, an attempt to say, you know, if if we're doing this three months from now, that three month window gives you enough time from the time we pass the policy to the time you would install to get the right thing ordered. Um, but if you've already ordered it, just because it's not installed by our effective by the date we pass it doesn't mean you can't use it. So that was the thinking around the motion or proposed motion. <clears throat> Thank you, Mandy. Andy, see your hand is up. Yes. I, okay, I wanted to make sure I wasn't muted. Um, well, but I want to thank you, uh, both of the, our sponsors, for the work that they did to get this language in order. I have several things, but I'm going to first mention is first as a matter of uh, Anika, you were going to bring uh, Tracy back at, when we got back to this item, if she had additional comments to make, and I didn't want to leave her out entirely. So I just wanted to mention that. But uh, going back to the proposed, uh, what, what Mandy had just gone through, at the bottom of page one, the yellow language, I was trying to figure out just the where the punctuation belongs on that. Uh, because it seemed like if the word street lighting, streets, uh, street light spacing will be at the discretion of the town council, but that seems like it's a continuation of the sentence before. And if it is, uh, then it would seem that after the words require a street light, there would be a period, not a comma. And you start a new sentence in order to maintain equity of determination for all residents. Streetlight spacing will be at the discretion of the town council. Is that what you meant? And if so is that better uh, use of punctuation? So I think the current policy has has the wording and this the punctuation and spacing as it is now with that street light spacing and illumination. This one says an illumination, the current policy at the discretion of the select board as a separate sentence, as a separate paragraph and all of that. Um, I think your language could work. We were trying to. Yeah, I, th I think your language might be able to work if we combine them but i think the spacing is different than location and that might be why guilford is raising his hand um because we have um you know yeah you maybe know. guilford's got something better but My comment was something else. I'm sorry, I don't think we could. I think Guilford raised his hand about something else, I believe. Oh, oh okay. Uh, well, it's a question to at least to give some thought to. I'm, I'm not sure, but I really had trouble structuring where the, those sentences really most logically fit together. So I just wanted to give you some thought on that. Just a couple of other things to go through. They're really uh, minor. Um, the uh, um, next section I've read on, uh, or on page two, where there are those three numbers, just make sure they all align correctly. Um, I would think that um, you'd need to look at that last sentence in red at the uh, at the bottom where it says, these standards are designed to minimize light pollution. I would put glare, up light, comma, and light trespass. Uh, 
uplight and light trespass, I think is maybe one thought. So it may be that it's these standards are designed to minimize light pollution, comma, glare, comma, uplight and light trespass, comma, and regulate illumination levels. Or we could also, oh, sorry. So I would just take a look at that again, and I can send that to you if it would be helpful. Andy, would it work in your mind to say as well as to regulate illumination levels? Instead of another and? So yes, be, you could do that too. I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying? Particularly yeah. myself. And and I would say uplight and light trespass are, they can be similar, but they're also different. Light trespass oh. is the, the light that goes beyond where you want to illuminate. Um, so thinking of a street light that illuminates half of a residence's yard, yeah. um, that would all be light trespass. Up light is also light trespass, so it's like a subset of total light trespass, but up light is a specific kind of light trespass. So the well, common I, I, I trust your judgment on that, but then you would, do you want the word and in there? In other like, words, should it be up light comma light trespass comma? I think, I think we fixed it because what yeah. we're trying to minimize is the light pollution glare, up light and light trespass. And we're not minimizing illumination levels. We're trying to regulate them. So we've separated that out with the, as well as too. I think that, I think that's more clear now. Okay. And the last thing that I wanted to raise and the, uh, the things that I spotted as I was reading through it is, and I, again, I really appreciate your addition on, I um, have to look for page numbers to make sure, uh, at the bottom, in page five, where you have the yellow. Um, but I, the question that I had is, upon recommendation of the superintendent of public works, the town council may wave. I was wondering if it um, should, um, it could be the superintendent, but if there's a similar request from any of the public safety departments or the town manager, Hmm. Um, so should it could it read upon recommendation of the superintendent of public works town manager um, or um, public a public safety department or in, in some order I'm not picking on the order yeah good point Andy I think if we just put town manager in there we cover it all yeah that's a possibility <laughs> I thought about that because they all work for they all yeah. work for the town manager. Uh, but I would certainly think that any of the three public safety departments may make a uh, suggestion of a similar nature. Yeah, I mean, I, this is bringing me back to the beginning, the very, very beginnings of our conversation where um, the other public safety entities really deferred to DPW on on this kind of stuff. So I, I think that that's a fair umbrella. And I'm assuming that most, if not all requests would come from from DPW. But I think it's a fair umbrella to put in. But uh, recommendation of town manager and leave it for the town managers to where the manager wants to get recommendations from. Absolutely. So that's fine. Yep. Okay, those were um, all of my comments, and so thank you. Thank you. Gilford? Do you, do you still want to keep the bug rating in, in this? Yes. My, my supplier, my supplier says that bug rating, they don't do it. They're not going to bug rate a fixture um, because there is no <clears throat> there is no real way of doing it to bug rate the fixture. It's like you cannot set your looms unless you know where it's going to be. So um, one, for us to inventory all the lights and get their bug ratings, it's not a matter of looking something up in a, a book that says this is what it is. It's actually going out and measuring, which you're kind of saying we have to go out and measure every street light anyhow. Um, I didn't see many more other things in this because it's the first time I've seen the, the revisions, but um, do we, 
do we want to have bug ratings in there? Do you want us to inventory every light and get the bug rating? Do you want us to inventory every light and put the put a loom pattern down from every light that's out there? Um, we can those can easily looms can be easily done based on um, a computer program, which is we plug in. But you have to actually go out and measure the bug rating the way the bug rating is set up now, and it's not really. Um, a lighting industry accepted method of measuring it's uh it's something that may come into into may come into existence and more acceptability future but right now it's not so i guess i'm looking at where the bug rating is used so are you talking about just number five here that's showing on the screen or there are two other places we we reference the bug rating um, yes you reference it in several places but you want you want us to one have a bug rating provided by the manufacturer which they don't do and the second one is to have a bug rating when we do the inventory of all the lightings which means we have to physically do the measurements out there on, on site for each light we can we can do rough loom, loom oh. illumination based on a computer model but we we have to physically do the bug ratings i mean it's just a matter of how much we want the effort we want to put into it i'm happy if you want to do it that way i'm happy to to leave it like that so I could I go on? Yes, please. I think under the maintenance standards, if we go down to that one, I would be okay eliminating the bug rating from the inventory. Um, you know, it's got wattage illuminance spectrum. Um, those are much easier to do. So I, I would be okay with that if, you know, that seems like a reasonable request. Um, And then when we go up to number five, the bug rating, I think I, I would like to leave it in, but I hear what you're saying, Guilford. So I wonder if we reworded it to, if provided by the manufacturer, manufacturer or luminaire should be selected with the lowest possible bug rating, ideally zero or one, something like that. Would, would that be acceptable, Guilford? It would be, yes. So it would reread if provided by the manufacturer, a luminaire should be selected with the lowest possible bug rating. Ideally, zero or one values of three or above are expressly prohibited. Does that work? Oh, we can get rid of the yes, phrase in the bug question. rating. Is, is the bug rating provided by the manufacturer or is that something we achieve that we, yeah. we measure? It's, it's something that would be provided <clears throat> by the manufacturer. It's through the um, Illumination Engineering Society, I believe is the Illuminating Engineering Society is the group that defined it. Um, but I, so I believe it would be, I guess we could probably determine it, but I think it would be something that the manufacturer would provide hypothetically. So our, our manufacturer is one of the largest manufacturers and for lighting and they don't do it. Yeah, what I'm trying to figure out, Mandy, is, is if this is something that we also, I was trying to look up some of the other policies that we had researched um, and kind of what was used there. Cause I mean, it's definitely, it's curious to me that it's not, like it wouldn't be used by the manufacturers as well. Um, Cause it's in, I mean, I know it's in Pepperell's um, I can't remember if it's in Cambridge's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. But but I think this change says, hey, if they do provide it, this yeah, is absolutely. going for, but it doesn't add all of that extra work, Guilford, that you were concerned about. Um, right. And then there were two other spots where bug ratings were mentioned. If we go up to page four, they're both on page four. The shield, the glare is one of them. You just page down under it. So B right there, glare. Um, this one, I don't think needs changed because it says can include considering the bug rating for glare. Um, so I think you are you should be okay with that because it's not required to consider that versus other things related to glare. 
And then the yes. next, okay. And then the next one is up at shielding. Um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this one might be okay too. We're, we're specifying specific lumens levels and then we re reference a bug rating, um, but it doesn't require that meaning that you don't have to find the bug rating or do you read that differently, Guilford? No, I, 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 I'm okay with that one there too. So I have a comp, comp question. Is it okay to go? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Um, so th there is there is this is sort of a standard that the town will use. There isn't a it's there's no sort of like it seems like the council has a can be a decision maker, but typically what you're saying is that as the town makes its decisions about streetlights, this is what we want how you we want you to implement it. Is that the way we read this? These are guidelines for us, right? In 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 terms of the decision making, it's still all the you know street lights right, pretty pretty much lives with the DPW. Am I reading that right? Well, what decisions come to the council? Right? Oh. There's one time where it comes to the council, oh. right? <laughs> I was going to ask you, like, are you asking like, are we deciding which? What the polls look like? Is that what you're asking? Um, well, yeah. Last time we ten, last you know, the previous council wanted to look at every trash can or something like. You know, this it depends where you want. What kind of detail do you want on this? And typically, the DPW just sort of does their thing. And I the way I read this is you're saying do your thing within these guidelines because we care about the light and how and all these considerations. So, yeah. and as long as you fall within those guidelines, you keep doing what you're doing. And when you go to replace lights comply with the guidelines right yep. okay. correct and so i think but i think there's just one one reference to the council where it comes the council the manager can come to the council to uh, go outside these guidelines right i think so there's a couple um many of which are left over from select board days all the way on page one we just replaced the word so at the very bottom select board with town council down there Right. Um, so that that's in in that entire set of paragraphs. So that would be, I think, you'd come to the council if there was a request for something outside of the location guidelines here. Got it. Yep. Um, and then um, we added the reference to the council in the dimming section. Is one of the bigger ones, and I think that's it but i'll do a yeah. search and as a, and i think this this you know if guilford feels it's workable from his sort of on the ground sort of looking at it and with his electricians as they look at it and they feel it's good the thing i think where it's going to get used is when we have disputes with with property owners or neighbors somebody wants one somebody doesn't they're both going to go to this policy and say ah you're either in compliance or you're not in compliance with your own policy and I and I think we there's some um, that's when people are going to start doing their own bug ratings and stuff like that. You know how we are in our community. Um, so um, as as I look at it from that eye, I, you know I think this we'll just see how this works out because it's it's policy, right? So we can always change things around. But but as I think about it, it's useful. The way I think of it as being useful, it's for the DPW's guide, its decision making, and also for, um, but it will come into play when someone says, I don't like the light you put up there, Guilford. I want it taken down because it, and then they're going to dig into this policy pretty detailed. Yeah, or if there's light trespass onto yeah. That that's probably at least for residences where most, most of common. what you come yeah. into is going to be that light is too much trespassing too much onto my property. Exactly. Um, so it needs a shield. It's it's not shielded enough to pre mm -hmm. prevent that trespass per the policy. But yeah, I, I think both Anna and I envisioned it as 
creating the guidelines for DPW to follow, not for the council to get really hyper involved with which oh. luminaire to choose <laughs> at all. Mm -hmm. Can we go up to page one? I don't know who's running this. Is that Athena? Athena. Um, where the streetlights will generally be provided. We had talked, it, it's down a little bit to where there's actually black. Yeah, <laughs> right there. <laughs> One of the parts we didn't change. Can we, it, it, we proposed, we left this in, then Tracy got back to us with some conversation at TAC about regional bus transit bus stops. So I think we're now proposing to delete that change. Um, so reject that change if TSO is okay with that. Okay. Um, did, did we want to hear Tracy's comment before? Yeah, and then I, I have a question. I also have uh, comments to share from both Dorothy and Shell. So if we could invite Tracy back into the room. Are we taking public comment from anyone? We will certainly take if anyone else I see there's uh, Jennifer and Jennifer I'm sorry for not um, seeing you earlier and Maura Keen if anyone uh, if anyone else has a comment please raise your hand <clears throat> if not we will invite Tracy back into the room Hi, Tracy, the floor is yours again for up to three minutes. Hi, so I'd actually be interested in hearing the feedback from the counselors that you have comments from before okay. I comment, if that's okay. Sure, I will. So with Dorothy Pam, she says, I'm hoping that the street lights bill will include having <laughs> all crosswalks and bus stops and remove none in residential neighborhoods. I totally support the aspects that make light less troublesome for humans and other living things. And Shalini shared that she has sent her, you know, um, questions on to both Anna and Mandy Joe, and that she is agreeable to the policy as amended. Okay, thank you. So should I make any of my Go comments right now? Right okay. Um, so I just wanted to um, to respond quickly to this um, the about the bus stops and crosswalks. Like it, just to emphasize, and the reason, and it wasn't just TAC; it was also the Disability Access Advisory Committee that also suggested that there be lighting there. Is that both of our committees, not to speak for. Um, the AAC, but they had mentioned it at their meeting. It's just we realize how important it is to have some form of lightning at those locations for the bus stops and crosswalks that are used at night, including as um, the council sponsors have talked about having rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Um, so my questions and comments, I mean, some of it to me was, it's mainly about the dimming policy, um, but just to clarify, when lights would actually be dimmed and for example um, the definitions of the village center boundaries and if there should be additional village areas included for example like the mill districts um, and i was thinking i mean one other area i was thinking about too is just in east amherst like for example the cumberland farm on Beltraton road is open 24 7 and so I guess I assume that that's probably in the East Amherst boundary, but the boundaries aren't always clear. And relatedly, I wasn't sure whether the municipal downtown parking district is the best way to represent what counts as downtown or not. Um, but in terms of the dimming policy and um, uh, Councilor Haneke had talked about the idea that they had looked at maybe um, restricting or doing less dimming on arterial roads. And I would still urge that I did hear, I do understand about, you know, certain arterials where they may be more suitable, but I went back and I looked at the, um, all of the reported crashes 
from the mass DOT um, crash database for the 2010 to 2020 three period um, for Amherst, looking at all the fatality crashes and the serious injury crashes. And 72% of those occurred on the major arterial, the principal arterials or the minor arterials. And over, you know, over 35% of them occurred at night. And we know too that um, in this time period, there were five pedestrian fatalities in Amherst. Um, and four of them were at night too. So to me, um, the thing with the importance of good lighting on the arterial roadways is that um, the speeds, there's higher traffic volumes at night, the speeds are still higher at night, the risks are greater at night. And I mean, the evidence is right, that that is where most of the crashes are occurring. Um, and when I looked at other communities' policies, and I did not find that money, but like, for example, the city of Cambridge, which does have a citywide policies related to dimming. So they do have some areas that they dim, some residential neighborhoods, they dim at 8 p.m. and others that they dim at 10. But in Cambridge, all the major roadways are not dimmed until midnight. And then I also looked at Tucson, Arizona's policy. They do not dim the lights in Tucson until after midnight as well. And Flagstaff, Arizona, which is one of the first, you know, it's an award-winning dark skies community. They also base their lighting on the road classifications. Um, so, I mean, the reality is that the serious injuries are happening mainly on Ontario's, the serious fatalities, and it's not just pedestrians, it's also other roadway users. Um, and so, and there's also been some studies there have not, it's not conclusive at this point, but, um, and I did share with the council sponsors that there have been studies that show that when you dim lights at night, there was one study from 2018 and it showed um, that when the lights were dimmed, even just moderately, that it did impact the participant driver's ability to see pedestrians. And so, um, I mean, maybe we could look, I mean, one, you could look at, you know, perhaps not dimming in arterials, um, roadways or not dimming on most arterial roadways or dimming later at night. I mean, some of those arterial roadways are having significant traffic through most of the night. Um, so I just would urge, I would just urge us as a town to be conservative about where we are dimming in these um, situations that are the most traffic risk and that, you know, as this is a policy, this can always be revised, but I would hate to go too far and then um, have adverse impacts. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I had one question about when you uh, mentioned Cambridge. So did you say that Cambridge was, do they actually dim their lights at some point down to um, 35% or do, or is that just what they have? They're only on at 30. No, Pepperell, Pepperell only has up to 30% Cambridge dims down. Okay. And and like at the same, about the same time, like hour after the latest business. Um, I haven't, I don't have the exact policy up in front of me. It's a little bit different. I, Tracy just cited some of the times, um, 8 p.m. and midnight, it's, I think is what she said. Yes. So so we have an article that says fixtures are dimmed to 70% prior to 10 p.m. or midnight and 35% thereafter. So we'd have to look at the exact policy and find it. I've always find Cambridge's website a pain to navigate. I think I just found it, so give me a little bit. <laughs> but like talk about other things because this feels high pressure now. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any other questions or comments while on a search in Cambridge? Mandy, I'm gonna send this to you so you can search with me. Okay. Um, Anika, I mean, I, I guess they do, they have the lighting zones. And so it's, I think that they're, the dimming would be shifted and we don't currently have them set up. Um, That's fine. I was just, I was just curious um, because I, I was um, surprised. That yeah. 
that they do too. That like it gave me a bit of a better understanding of what 70 would be because I was there not too long ago in the evening. And I, you know, so it's kind of that was helpful as a visual. Yep. Um, and then I know there were questions about the map of the village center. Um, we information from the master plan, I believe. Is that correct, Mandy? So we the, the, current, the proposed policy, the only strict definition is that municipal parking district, um, which you know is not necessarily the greatest um definition right now for the downtown, um, but it's one of the easiest to use. Um, and when, you know, as, as Anna said, Cambridge, a lot of places, our original proposal used lighting zones where you can cross different boundaries and create your own lighting zones. If we're not going to go that route and, and from all of the conversations we've had at this time, that route was not necessarily wanted. Um, defining sort of those pedestrian areas, those, those walkable business areas gets a little harder. Um, so the, the use was the municipal parking district in the downtown. In the other areas, the definition is basically very vague, but specific. Um, <laughs> you gotta love that. Um, it, 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 I'll, I'll read the definition. Village centers, the areas of Amherst generally referred to as North Amherst Village Center, Cushman, Pomeroy Village Center and East Amherst Village Center. So, so there's no strict boundaries. So there's there's a little bit of that leeway in there to to in some sense allow for that interpretation by the DPW of um, is this an area where we should have streetscape or where the utility pole is more appropriate. Um, there's no defined unlike our original policy. There's no defined quarter mile, half mile these exact areas or anything. It's it's a little more squishy, which might actually be better for our town as we work to, you know, East Amherst Village is going undergoing a ton of changes in the next couple of years. And so where the streetscape lighting goes could, could change dramatically in that. Um, and so this allows for that squishiness. Thank you. Okay, last call. Any questions or comments? Andy. Yeah, I have, uh, uh, Mandy, going back to a section that you talked about previously, uh, I just wanted to touch, ask a question about it. And that's on page four, uh, where we talk, where you have the def uh, nuisance B, and you had said, uh, because of the reference to bug rating, the determination will be made by the superintendent of public works of their or their designee through site visit and uh, can include considering the bug rating for glare. And you said, well, since it says can, it's okay. Then afterwards it says, which would, should be no higher than G1. Does that in effect create a standard that even though you're saying that they can consider, but you're also creating a standard, I just don't understand enough of it to know how that works, but it seemed like it was in conflict. Yeah, so so it is, um, but that standard's created lower too, um, in a sense where we say in number five, bug rating, the bug rating ideally zero or one and values of three or above are expressly prohibited. So, so there's that wish-washy with the number two, right? Um, so um, this is should be no higher. So basically what we're saying in this whole policy is we want zeros and ones everywhere for all the lighting, for all the luminaires. Um, those, those actually have numbers attached to them for the lumens, um, the uplight, 100 lumens is the threshold for um, the U2 cutoff. Um, so, you know, each of these have their own sort of internal standards. Um, but yeah, so it is, but it's not a shall. It's not a must. It's not of that. And so if there is a bug rating on something, we're looking for zeros and ones 
um, twos might be okay depending on where it's installed. Um, but the idea is to lower those as much as possible. Okay. No, that's a good explanation. Uh, as long as Guilford is okay with it, I'm okay with it. Thank you, Andy. Guilford. Um, with Andy's comment, I think I think we're okay with it. Um, but then reading what Andy I kept reading past what Andy was reading, I got the sky glow. What is the baseline for sky glow we're not supposed to increase? I mean, if, if um, Athena, if you can scroll down a little bit. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, hypothetically, it would be a before and after, but we don't necessarily have the before. Um, and so I think that it's really looking at probably the closest nearby area and then the area nearby the street light. Mandy, would you say that there's a different way? Yeah, um, you might have found something we didn't calculate, right? Um, well, sky glow also changes during due to due to weather patterns, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I think I, I, the goal, right, um, when we're we're talking about intent of this, is um, really that that uplight. You know, because this is this is light trespass glare. It's not really totally uplight, but uplight is part of this, right? Because um, that's where sky glow a lot of times happens. Although there's reflective glare that can cause sky glow. Um, so the uplight, we should make sure that we're not installing items that you know luminaires that, particularly when we talk about the streetscape lighting because we're allowing up to a hundred lumens of uplight that that's not that that the whole consideration of what would that do to the downtown compared to you know now um although now is a lot right we're actually trying to reduce now um you know to to i i actually think the goal is to get it as low as possible, lower than what we have now. And so, yeah, I, I will agree this wording, um, technically the overall brightness or color of the night sky would actually reference zero lights at all. Um, but that's not reasonable, right? <laughs> and we know that. Um, so, so yeah, um, we want lower than we have now. We know, given that the policy allows for uplight, a little bit of uplight in streetscape lighting, we're not going to get to zero, right? Um, so somewhere in between. It would probably be calculated through pictures, or there's that one website um, that that gives you the lighting. I don't know whether I still have it. Um, Is it the light pollution map? Is that the one? Yeah, that light pollution map that really gives you from the sky numbers. We definitely wouldn't want to exceed any of that. We'd actually, I think at one point, Anna and I said we wanted it down to, I have to look at my memo. Um, So now I have to find a different memo. So the Bortle classes we were talking about right now, UMass is a class six in this Bortle class and much of Amherst is class five. Um, class five is considered a suburban sky. Class six is a bright suburban sky um, on this scale. And 
we had stated in our memo that our goal would be a class three or lower sky for all of Amherst. Class three is considered suburban to rural transition. Uh, no, class three is considered rural sky. Um, and we have pictures of what that would look like. That's sort of the goal. Um, but that's not necessarily put in here. Anna might have other thoughts. No, I think that I think that about I think you got it. And it was light pollution map dot info that shows where we currently are. Yeah, so I mean, looking at this, if you're looking at like Lawrence Swamp is a class four, downtown UMass is a class six. Um, yeah. And the memo, there's a memo that we wrote to TSO on January 6th, 2023, that has a picture of what those classes mean um, and references that, that website. So that might give you an idea of where we're aiming for. Do you have suggested language, Guilford? No, I just thought it was just left wide open. Would TSO be okay? We'd have to add the def definition of the Bordel index or the Bordel classes, um, but we we could put some language into SkyGlow that indicates what our aim for the town is on the Bordel scale. Gilford, would that be helpful? You feel that would be helpful? Yeah, it would, I guess. Something that we can point to and say during a during a normal normally clear night, this is what you expect it to be. Does that sound good to you, both Andy and Anna? I'm fine with that if we can come up with it. Um, I think the language we could potentially use is you know, on a Bortle class scale or on a Bortle scale. Where are you adding this? Uh, I would just add it right where your cursor is <laughs> for ease of adding. So and can, can you spell Bortle? I will. It's B O R. T-L-E with the B capitalized. I think it's some person's last name. On a Bortel scale, the goal is to achieve a class three or lower sky for nearly all of Amherst. So we're in the Bortel, the Bortel right now for almost all of Amherst is the lowest is four. Right. So, mm -hmm. so I think, I think what I would say is where Amherst is four, we want three or lower and where Amherst is five or six, that's where we're aiming for four. Yeah. I feel like you could say in term, because we can only do this to the public ways. I think we could right. say, um, for areas outside of village centers and downtown, yeah. like, I think that that might be reasonable to expect to, that the village center mm -hmm. of downtown may be a little bit higher. Yeah, so instead of for nearly all of Amherst, for areas outside of the municipal parking district and village centers. Yeah. So 
sorry, uh, and and village centers, and both of those references get initial caps mm -hmm. as defined terms in the policy. Does that feel better, Guilford? You're muted, sorry. I, I mean, I assume that's a total yes, you're, on, you're fully on board and, and excited now. <laughs> you're still muted, so I'm still assuming it's all a positive response. My cursor was way over on the map. I'm looking around the map, seeing what all the portal ratings are. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're fine, you're fine. It's a fascinating website. It's super interesting. It is. It's uh I mean, I mean, if we actually we can <clears throat> I mean this says 20 the map I see it says 2015. Oh, this is 2022. Oh wow, that's pretty cool. Uh yeah, <laughs> as long as we have something to reference, that, that's really what we want. <laughs> I think he's going down a rabbit hole later <laughs> Yeah, sorry. We've gone down this rabbit hole, Gilford. It's a really cool one. <laughs> Um, all right, so so I feel like that's then I'm I'm about ready to make a motion, but I want to make sure there aren't any if there isn't anything lingering, and I also want to make sure I'm making the proper motion. Um, so can I ask the clarifying? Because Mandy, the motion that you wrote in the document that's really intended for council. Um, what I was going to make a motion was I'm not making it yet, Kelly, but it would be for TSO to recommend the acceptance of the amended streetlight policy with all edits as shown in this revised draft. Does that work for a TSO motion, uh, Athena or Mandy, or do I need to read the, the actual council motion? Because we're just recommending. Oh. You're recommending, but I think the council might be helped by having a recommended sort of implementation, which is why this one's kind of written as a TSO. Um, okay. Because then it goes to the council with that effective date language too. Okay. All right. So I am uh, I am ready then. You can you can modify the deleting the lined out and all of that with what yeah. you have said because. Yeah, I'm gonna say as amended in the draft. Okay, so um, hang on one second, I gotta write it. Okay, so I move that the TSO committee recommend to the council as keeper of the public way, the revision of the Amherst streetlights policy, The this is grammatically incorrect now, uh, as amended by TSO and uh, um, by, hang on, I'm screwing this all up. Because I want to include the amendment. So do I say, Kelly, pause this. I'm starting over. Um, so do I say that as amended and Athena, you're laughing at me and I know it. <laughs> I always I, I will say, Anna, I always say as amended at the meeting of X. That's enough. I can just say that. Yep. Amended oh. at the at the meeting of T, at the TSO meeting on. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna start over and I'm gonna do it not correctly, but closer to correctly. Okay. Um so. I move to recommend to the council as keeper of the public way, uh, the revised Amherst Streetlights policy as amended by TSO on June 15th, 2023, with the following effective dates. Effective September 1st, 2023 for all new or replacement streetlights and for existing streetlights lawfully installed prior to September 1st, 2023, full compliance no later than September 1st, 2033. Could you just one more time um, read, <laughs> the, <laughs> read the part about, um, yes, let's see, um, the revised streetlights policy. Actually, okay, let's, if you could read the whole thing once yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe it's easier, Kelly, if you read what you have and then Anna can tell you what's missing. Good idea. So I have, um, Devlin Gothier move, seconded by, we'll see, um, that the TSO committee recommend that the town council as keeper of the public way, um, I'm missing a word here. Is it like, is it adopt? Revise or amend. Um, revise. The Amherst Streetlights Amherst Street policy. Uh, as amended 
by TSO on June 16th, 2023. It's the 15th still. 15th, sorry, 15th, 15th, 15th. Thank you. Amended by TSO on June 15th, 2023. And then the next part is just the, um, with the following effective dates and those dates listed on the screen, correct? Correct. Great, okay. All right, so I said that that is on the table. I still need a second. Oh my golly, G. Willikers. And I'll second it. Thank you, Andy. All right, and I will call it. Anna. Aye. Andy. Aye. And I am an aye. Wait, I'm sorry. Guilford, your hand is up. Oh, sorry. Oh, Guilford, don't scare me like that. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, so that is unanimous with two absent. I, I did have one comment. Go right ahead. So this this Boral map is- too late they voted, we're moving on. This, <laughs> this Boral map is pretty cool, but where I live, I have no street lights. There's not a street light at the end of my street, either end or anywhere in the middle of my street. It's dark, it's, we love it. Oh. Um, but my Boral rating's four. So I think it'll be curious to look at how they measure it and how the like the spread of in terms of like sky glow, how far that might go, right? Because I think that that's how they they're doing this through GIS mapping. And so I, I mean, I think that might be indicative of just how impactful that uplighting and sky glow can be. A uh, way you can put and, your address in. And Zoom street in. lights are only one part of lighting, right? You you don't have any street lights, but if someone throws a we we get some floodlights in our neighborhoods, <laughs> floodlighting driveways. That's going to change it. So we, and I will say, I recognize that just the street lights alone will have a difficult time getting those down there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's actually. I'm sorry to drag this out, but it's a nerdy thing. I like it. Um, <clears throat> UMass is really the driver behind this. I mean, the campus yeah. is the driver. That's been um, that's been a topic of conversation a couple times because we recognize that that is not within the public way and it's the most significant contributor across town to like it is. Can Sorry, you thank you. Your address? No, no thank you. we nerd we nerd out about it too. It's okay. <laughs> no, I actually just I, I know where my house is. I just went on the map and found it. Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know if you can type in an address, but you can zoom in. I see. It's really interesting. Thank you all. Um, Mandy, I want to, I know that we've been working on this together, but I, I want to thank you on the record in the committee, because I know that this has been a beast for almost a year, if not over a year, and uh, it's done a lot of iterations and we're not done yet, but I really appreciate TSO taking the time on this and Mandy's patience in this process as well. Thank and you. Guilford's patience in this process. <laughs> Everybody's, Guilford, everyone's Guilford's input and, and TSO's input along with TAC and DAAC and we heard a little bit from planning board. We've been all over. It's been very, I think it's been a great process. Yeah. A long process, but a good one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Oh, thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Gilford. For being with us. Staying with us. Okay. So we do not have any items that have come in. Oh, just a, just a quick note. This will go to GOL um, yes. for review before it comes to the council. It was referred to TSO with okay. input from finance and GOL. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Athena. All right. Um, does anyone have an announcement to make? Anything to share? I'll just share that we have the Family Outreach of Amherst fundraiser light up the night going on tomorrow night. And we have a bunch of Juneteenth celebrations uh, for the town of Amherst. Um, I don't know if you've seen the hashtag Juneteenth Amherst Mass. That's um, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Please cross all your fingers that the weather will be kind. And I believe that that is it for us this evening. Thank you all for being here and see you next meeting. Good night. Thank you everybody. Thank you all so much.